The first matter to come before the court this morning is State of Ohio versus Clifton Jackson. Uh, the appellant has waived oral argument. You have 15 minutes to do with as you please. We have read the briefs and I'm ready to proceed to the court. All right. Mary Spolanska on behalf of Appellee, the State of Ohio. Uh, there were just a few things that I wanted to point out to the court. The first assignment of error regards uh, suppression. I wanted to note that the defendant was stopped for following too close. There was extremely detailed testimony by the trooper about how close the vehicle was to a motor home and um, he actually caught uh, the following too close on his camera, uh, which I believe was admitted in evidence. Okay. And I hate to stop you so quickly, Go ahead. but you just hit on something good. I was just, when I read that, I, I was wondering, and I'm, we'll be able to look at the video, how it is, unless you're videotaping from the air, he gets that on his video. Well, I, I, think, I don't think he testified exactly, but I believe what the video is going to show is that he was in another lane kind of coming up on and could see the distance. And what he didn't just say based on, and, and you have to take it in light of his testimony too, where he explains these are how long the, the hash marks, the lane marks are in the road. This is the distance between the marks. So based on that, as I see the defendant go past each of these marks, I'm able to say this is how, how many feet behind this other vehicle. And I think it was like maybe 30 to 60 feet, and the officer said that was just way too close to be able to stop in a uh, safe distance. Okay, I, I've seen the video, mm -hmm. and I, I do see what the officer's talking about. Okay. On the other hand, the officer is in the lane right next to this guy right. who's behind the motorhome. Right. And if this guy's going to try to pass the motorhome, he's got to squeeze in between the cop and the back of the motorhome in that little space to go around. So, right. I mean, it, it, there's a limited amount of space there to get... <coughs> There's, there's a limited amount of space right next to them. There, there is a limited amount of space to pass, but what, kept, what we've all faced is you're behind somebody that's going exceptionally slow, and for whatever reason, you can't pass them. Then you don't have a right to tailgate them. You, have, you can't follow too close. You have to slow down. And, and you know, as much as, as drivers that aggravates us, I think that, that was the situation here. It wasn't that he didn't get out and pass this, this motor home. It was that while he was behind it, he was just simply too close. And his his option was at that point, if he couldn't pass, to slow down and to put some distance between himself and that other vehicle. So I think that there was um, there was probable cause for the stop, which is what the trial court uh, found in this case, based well, on the really talking about reasonable suspicion. Yes, we are. And but but and I put this in a footnote, which is something yeah. I don't normally do. But um, I think that that. In, in this case, there's no harm to the defendant that the trial court used the wrong standard because it's the more rigorous standard, you know. And if and, and there's quite a bit of case law that if there's probable cause, then there has to be reasonable suspicion because that would come before or below the probable cause standard. So it, there was no prejudice to the defendant when the trial court made that um, mistake. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that um, the defendant argues in his second assignment of error that. Um, the state improperly brought up evidence that he had invoked his right to Miranda um, and did not give a statement. And I just, uh, I think when you read in context what happened, the um, officer testifying was that he, he, the purpose in bringing him in was he works for the Sheriff's Department and the Drug Task Force. When they seized the drugs, he came in to, uh, he didn't even interview, it was his partner, and he mentions that his partner that had asked the gentleman. They wanted to see if this, this gentleman would cooperate, if the defendant would cooperate. Um, he invoked his right to Miranda, and the purpose of putting um, Detective Taliano on was because he had taken custody of the physical evidence, the drugs, and had them uh, shipped to Chicago to be tested. And that was why the prosecutor had called him. And so I think from the context, you can see that it was a complete surprise when he asked the officer, and, you know, what, what did you do to assist in this investigation? And the officer then volunteers, defendant invoked his right to Miranda. The prosecutor did not comment on that, didn't focus on it, and immediately moved on and kind of redirected and asked a little bit more specific question, you know, do, you know what did you do? Did you take possession of anything? Which then focused on, on uh, um, you know, kind of refocused everything. So I don't, and there, there's case law that says that, um, it's not a violation of the defendant's rights if, if Miranda, you know, if the fact that they invoke Miranda is mentioned, 
if it's not used as substantive evidence of guilt. And in this case, that it simply was not. There was no argument that, hey, he, he invoked his Miranda and wouldn't talk to us, so he must be guilty. That didn't happen. The prosecutor didn't even bring this up in closing argument. In fact, when I talked to him later, he was like, oh, I couldn't believe he said that. And, you know, I just, like, tried to move away as quickly as I could, which the record bears out in this case. Um, there was no objection to it. And, and, and no motion to strike. But no motion to strike, no objection. It was, a, it was an extremely fleeting remark, and I think that um, in the context of the fourth assignment of error where the defendant argues ineffective assistance, you know, that, that could have been a very legitimate trial tactic for counsel to say, everybody's heard the word Miranda, everybody knows you have a right to Miranda, and I'm not going to focus more attention on it by objecting or, or going on. And I think that that was a reasonable um, trial tactic given that the prosecutor immediately moved away from um, what had been volunteered and it wasn't specifically solicited by the state. I think it was a uh, a slip by a veteran officer who, you know, just made a mistake in this case, but I don't believe that the defendant was um, prejudiced by this. And as far as the second assignment of error, I want to point out that as there was no objection, the defendant had an obligation to, to kind of frame this as um, plain error, and he didn't do that. And I, I think that based on that, it would be sufficient to dismiss it. But I think on the, on the, on the merits of the assignment of error, it also uh, should be overruled. Um, it, with, with regard to the speedy trial, I think that my brief speaks for itself. Um, on the ineffective assistance of counsel, um, the only other things I want to point out are the defendant argues that his trial counsel should have objected when the court um, chose to go forward without his presence on the second day of trial. Um, he had been advised what time he needed to be in court, the defendant I'm speaking of. When he wasn't there, the trial court went on the record and inquired counsel where your client. He said, I've been trying to call him. I've left him voice messages. I can't get a hold of him. And there's case law that I've cited in my brief that says, you know, that a defendant is considered voluntarily absent if there's no explanation by defense counsel. In other words, you know, there's some problem and defendant never called and said, hey, you know, I know I'm not there. I know I'm supposed to be there. You know, tell the court I'll be there as quick as I can, which in this case, it turns out, when the defendant came in, the trial was in process. They brought him in, uh, the trial goes on for a little bit that morning, and then when they take their first break, the judge questions the defendant about his absence earlier in the day, and the defendant says, you know, I had car trouble, I couldn't get my car started. Well, I would submit anybody with experience that kind of thing is gonna get to the first phone they can call their attorney and say, hey, I've got car trouble, because they don't want a bench warrant, they don't want the wrath of the court if they're not there. Well, the he said that he was trying to reach his lawyer, but well, but he probably couldn't because the lawyer was in court. Well, the lawyer had tried to call him, I think he said about three times, and had left him a message, and he didn't respond to any of that. So, um, you know, he, and what the, the attorney spoke about was, I haven't heard from him, I didn't get anything. There's not a question of a missed call or, you know, anything else, or, or a voicemail or anything, so. Well, they did ask the court to, uh, recall the witnesses so that the defendant could be present. Right, but at, time. but at that time, certainly the court knew that the defendant um, had, had indicated that he had a car trouble. I think that they knew that, but I don't think that it was um, improper not to recall. First of all, the defendant didn't bring it up at trial in the context of, I want the witnesses recalled because I wasn't here. What he brought up was, I want the witnesses, or the, or the defense counsel, I want the witnesses recalled so I can question them about the legality of the traffic stop. And the trial court had previously said, that's not, and the case law supports this, that's not an issue for the jury whether the traffic stop was valid. There was a motion to suppress, the court ruled on it, had made that legal conclusion, and that's not an issue for the jury to consider. So the basis of him asking for those witnesses to be recalled um, was something that the court had control, you know, had the ability to control the trial and say, no, I'm not going to let you recall it for something that you can't get into anyway. So I think that was, I think it was proper for the trial court to say, I'm not going to recall those witnesses. And on appeal, the defendant argues for the first time, well, it was because I wanted to hear what they had to say. I wasn't here. Well, he should have objected on that basis at the trial, or he should have articulated that reasoning uh, to the trial court. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, it just on assignment of error seven, and then I'll, I'll wrap up, 
the defendant was uh, wearing some kind of ankle bracelet. I'm not clear from the record whether it was in connection with this case and you know, a bond or something or what have you. But during the trial, the court hears a buzzing that, or a noise, a beeping that sounds like a cell phone. And the court stops and says, what's that noise? He isn't directing the question at the defendant. You know, it's to the courtroom at large. Jurors, witnesses, people in the back, everybody. You know, what's that noise? Is that a cell phone? And the defendant volunteers, it's my ankle bracelet. Apparently the battery was going low and it started to beep. And now the defendant argues for the first time that um, the trial court erred in, uh, in allowing that information to be before the jury. In other words, there should have been a mistrial because the jury was aware that he was under restraints. Well, an ankle monitor doesn't necessarily uh, rise to the level of like shackles or other cases. And what uh, the case law tells us is that even an inadvertent view by the jury, you know, where it's inadvertent, it's very short, it is not necessarily prejudicial. And the burden is on the defendant to show that he suffered some prejudice as a result of it. And I also want to note for the court that um, this is almost like an invited error. The defendant is the one who volunteered, hey, I'm wearing an ankle bracelet. He could have simply leaned over and said to his attorney, hey, it's my, my ankle bracelet. And the attorney could have said, judge, may, I, may we approach? You know, there, there's certainly a way to do it um, that wasn't done here. And I just don't think that there was any prejudice as a result of uh, the jury being aware that he may have been on an ankle monitor. Um, and if there are no other questions, then Thank you. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a written decision which will be mailed to both sides as well as posted on our website and the Oscar Court website.